è spento ok right you can hear me now let me repeat that that uh, i find myself this morning following in the footsteps of uh, a couple of nobel laureates my co-laureates uh, jean-pierre savage and ben ferenga and then being uh, as it were the warm-up act for um, Vincenzo Bolzani's uh, performance that we're all looking forward to. Uh, what I've decided <coughs> to do is to sort of uh, take some more recent chemistry uh, under the uh, <coughs> uh, banner of radical chemistry, and you can read more than one um, sentiment into that uh, couple of words, and uh, use it to um, make my way eventually to uh, <coughs> artificial molecular machines. So let, let's go back in time. The father of radical chemistry, as much agreed as uh, this man, uh, Moses Gomberg, uh, because it was <coughs> at the turn of the last century that uh, he brought on the scene uh, the uh, triphenyl methyl radical. And uh, he is uh, much lauded today in his uh, uh, alma mater, I guess, or uh, where he was uh, working at the time, the University of Michigan. Um, <clears throat> the most remarkable thing, I think, about this paper that was published in the Journal of American Chemical Society is that the last sentence read, and I reserve this area of research for myself. So he wasn't very successful, uh, thank goodness. Uh, so many followed in his wake, and the classes of uh, stable radicals include those ones, and I'm not going to talk about them. What I'm going to... Uh, <coughs> obviously speak about, are those that are based on uh, <coughs> the bipyridinium herbicides that I spoke about yesterday that uh, I had the great good fortune to meet when I uh, spent three years at the Imperial Chemical Industries corporate lab in Runcorn in Cheshire. And so <coughs> we'll be zeroing in mainly on uh, paraquit or what the rest of the world also know as methyl biologin. And uh, <coughs> here, of course, uh, you can summarize its redox properties very nicely by saying that if you uh, effectively start up here with the dication, you feed in an electron, you get a radical uh, cation, and then feed in another electron, and you have a neutral molecule. And it's nicely reversible. Now, <coughs> the uh, history after the period of uh, Gomberg passes to uh, people like Michaelis in the 30s, and uh, Siegfried Koenig at uh, the University of Würzburg, uh, still alive today in his 90s, uh, <coughs> who worked uh, these people uh, very much in this uh, realm. Uh, <coughs> then there's the late uh, Professor Koshi from uh, Houston, who uh, showed that uh, the uh, radicals uh, would, uh, in the crystalline state, uh, become stacked in this sort of way and uh, were clearly uh, talking to each other. Uh, and then in more recent times, forays into, um, if you like, supramolecular uh, systems, of which, of course, uh, the crystal structure up here is an example, but here is one using cucurbiturol uh, with uh, eight repeating units uh, by Kim Oint Kim uh, in Korea, uh, where the um, diradical is uh, nicely trapped. And then another example here, so that I can... Uh, name the player of one of the, uh, one of the other players of this uh, sort of older trio, Professor Kosovar. Right, so <coughs> the person I want to start off featuring is uh, a Lebanese uh, <coughs> chemist, Ali Trabolsi, who uh, joined my group in the final days that we were at UCLA and transitioned through to Northwestern. And I call him the radical man from the Lebanon. Uh, he was... Um, <coughs> trained in uh, Strasbourg uh, as a physical chemist. Uh, and uh, the remarkable thing is that he carried out, I think, the most daring piece of synthetic chemistry in my group um, in the last decade. Because it was he who said, if I take uh, methyl biologin and our much lauded or whatever, uh, little blue box, if I reduce them, Ali said, uh, with, say, something like zinc dust, 
in an inert atmosphere in acetonitro, what would happen? And it was amazing. He gets a very, very <coughs> strong one-to-one -one complex uh, expressed by these uh, physical constants here, so a good substantial stability constant, obviously enthalpically driven against uh, the loss of entropy. And <coughs> he's followed by uh, Albert Fahrenbach, and I'll come back and talk about Albert later in my talk, um, who manages uh, to uh, take this one-to-one -one complex and crystallize it so that uh, it's more or less, not quite an orthogonal disposition of the um, <coughs> methyl violation radical with respect to the uh, uh, now purple box. So I go over in color to using purple to represent the uh, tris radical complex and the infinite stack that, not surprisingly, it forms as well. So we use this uh, chemistry quite quickly uh, <coughs> to uh, get involved in a new way of making uh, mechanically interlocked molecules. So here's an example, courtesy of Hao Li, um, a Chinese graduate student who took um, the uh, components that you see here uh, and using uh, the <coughs> system that is much I think uh, uh, used in the past in Bologna with uh, Vincenzo, uh, the uh, <coughs> photosensitizer here, the ruthenium bipi in the presence of a sacrificial electron donor, and light. And uh, on shining light onto it uh, makes this uh <coughs> tris radical tricationic complex and then captures it um, because this is only a pseudo-rataxane, inner rataxane by a reaction, which is um, a one that is a, a copper-free, if you like, click reaction that we actually popularized uh, back in our Birmingham days. However, if um, you take this uh, catenine, sorry, the rataxane, out of the uh, inert atmosphere and just let it sit on the bench, it's very quick in terms of uh, it being oxidized back up to what you might call this hexacationic species. And Coulombic repulsion obviously comes into play, and you have generated another type of molecular shuttle where this uh, box, over quite high um, energy barrier, it's an electrostatic one, can jump from where it is on the right here to the left in a degenerate kind of fashion. And so I just show this uh, experimental data that uh, reveals that uh, at room temperature, yes, the cyclophane in the oxidized form is sitting here. Here are these very high uh, field signals for uh, these uh, methylene protons that are being encircled by it. And uh, <coughs> they are compared, obviously, here with the uh, <coughs> spectrum of the blue box itself down in the aromatic region. And so what Howley did uh, further having started uh, with uh, 11 methylene groups and the one you were looking at, was to uh, very quickly go down and shorten the chain uh, on each side to 6, 5, 4, and 3. And uh, <coughs> by the time he got to 6, he had dropped in terms of uh, this electrostatic barrier, which uh, we really couldn't measure. All we could say is it was over 17 kilocalories per mole uh, for the 11 down to barriers that we could measure, and they kind of plateaued out at 12. Uh, <clears throat> but what turned out to be, I think, even more uh, interesting to us was that as the barrier decreases, the um, <clears throat> stability of the radical species is on the increase. So this one, a few minutes, then a few hours, about a day for the one with four and several days, uh, out on the bench for the one with three. And so this um, <coughs> could also be, of course, followed by uh, cyclic voltammetry. And here you see the black trace relates to just the dumbbell component on its own, the green one to the uh, blue box on its own. And so the difference here is, of course, that we have single electrons going in in the reduction at these two points, whereas we have two electrons simultaneously going in at these points. If you take the <coughs> black and the green and you effectively just add them together uh, like this, uh, you get this red curve. And you'll notice that 
the actual experimental result for the uh, rituxane is quite different. And I won't have a lot of time to go into it today, but it's much more subtle than just being a trisradical tricationic complex because as you do the reduction here, you find that there's a stability associated with a bisradical dicationic complex and that um, you need a higher voltage in a negative sense in order to put the third electron in. And this is played out also in going towards the neutral species and it's beautifully reversible as well. So this fired up the imagination of <coughs> one of the uh, most creative um, young American students that I've had in my time at uh, the University of uh, Northwestern. Uh, he comes from the UK. Oh, no, no, not the one you were thinking of, uh, where Brexit rules at the moment, but uh, from the University of Kentucky. And uh, Jonathan said, um, as a green graduate student, why don't I uh, be courageous and uh, see if I can form a complex between this dibromide and the familiar blue box, just using the chemistry that uh, Ali Trabolsi and Hao Li had uh, shown in their experiments in an inert atmosphere. And he makes this, uh, <coughs> again, trisk radical tricationic complex. It's actually well... <coughs> Uh, <coughs> characterized, we have a crystal structure, I'm not going there today. All I want to do is to show you that if you simply add some bipyridine under these conditions, then you obtain a modest yield of uh, the homocatenine of uh, what ultimately becomes um, <coughs> a, if you bring it out into the uh, bench and the atmosphere, a septa radical monocation, and it takes a bit of uh, uh, <coughs> further, um, as it were, um, oxidation to push it through, which we can do to the octocation. We'll come back to that. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this mixed valence system is a new example, if you like, of a persistent uh, organic radical cation. And so, <coughs> The remarkable thing about this is that once you push it through to the octocation, we've actually made a homocatenine of our blue box. And if you had asked me, um, even a few years ago, if that would have been possible, I would have said, I don't think it is because of just the amount of positive charge. But the radicals opened the door to this new chemistry. And here's what I'm talking about. If you take this uh, magic blue oxidant, this uh, compound here, you can uh, convert this uh, mixed valence system through to the octocation. And of course, um, the NMR spectra of these earlier species are um, not really available to us, but as soon as you get through to the octocation, um, you see a very nice clean NMR spectrum. And what is more, unlike um, systems that I spoke about yesterday, and we'll refresh your memory on today, these two rings are really, really interlocked. You would have to go probably above a temperature where uh, they would start to decompose the, um, uh, the, the molecules uh, before you would get any uh, <coughs> circumrotation of one ring with respect to the other. And so here is the uh, crystal structure of the uh, monoradical septicatine. We uh, know from just counting the number of counterions what the uh, is where redox state of the molecule is, but what uh, Jonathan was able to basically uh, reveal for us was that if there was a radical associated with bipyridinium units, and clearly it's shared between these two, then the um, dihedral angle between the pyridinium or pyridine-based rings uh, closes down to more or less zero, whereas if they're dicationic in nature, then it hovers around about 20. And here's just a movie showing that these two rings are almost, not quite, orthogonal to each other in the um, <coughs> homo uh, catenine uh, that's uh, associated with the uh, monoradical. Um, and then beyond the molecule, at the supramolecular level, uh, there is an interesting uh, phenomenon that I'll just touch on, and uh, it does lead to... Uh, 
conducting materials, but I'm not going to go there today. Uh, so we have uh, the monoradical and the bisradical, which um, effectively, with their bipyridinium units as cations, dications on the outside, the molecules don't speak to each other in other than um, paraphenylene weak pi pi stacking interactions. But if you take um, the <coughs> tetraradical tetracation here, then uh, you have radicals everywhere, and so they then um, speak to each other between these uh, different molecules, and instead of getting these cubes, we get this uh, needle-shaped uh, type of compound. And uh, this Indian postdoc then went on to do quite a lot of, uh, as it were, experiments on conductivity in relation to that system. But I can't spend my time talking about that today. I just want to reflect on the fact that, uh, as we do with most of our chemistry, uh, that is uh, pushing the um, envelope a bit, is we uh, also interact with one of the best uh, computational chemists in the United States, Bill Goddard, now 80 plus, um, and with um, Diego Benitez, Benitez um, they did some uh, DFT calculations, and really all I want to pick out from this is um, that um, there is, in their way of speaking about it, about 30% of covalency to be associated with uh, the interaction of the radicals, both in the mixed radical state and in the diradical state. And then when we get to the octa uh, cationic state, no surprise, whether you're in the gas state or in the solution state is going to be the uh, <coughs> most unstable of the species. And uh, then particularly in the solution state, um, maybe not surprisingly, the radical at the tetraradical, tetracationic state is the most stable. And so in characterizing this system, uh, Jonathan used uh, the uh, uh, absorption spectrum here to show that uh, the uh, diradical, where we have uh, the um, interaction between the two radicals, gives this blue trace. And so um, it is distinguishable from those that have uh, free electrons, uh, both the um, septocation with one uh, radical, which uh, is here, 1415 uh, in the near infrared, and then the uh, tetraradical, tetracation, even higher at 1586, uh, or 1565, sorry, um, in terms of its absorption. And that's just a reminder that um, we also um, made the um, <coughs> octocation, and there's the X-ray crystal structure of it, and there you see again this principle of uh, the angles associated with the bipyridinium units when they're dicationic, hovering around 20. And so we ended up with crystal structures of all of these, the 8+, plus, the 7+, plus, the 6+, plus, and the 4+. Plus. In terms of their uh, EPR and uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> further electrochemistry that you see here, uh, we, of course, in principle, going from 0 to 8 uh, plus, could see maybe nine states. Uh, in fact, um, experimentally, we only see six. And they're the six that uh, are up here, as shown in this uh, is it DPV. Uh, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> at this stage, uh, we'll introduce Marco Frasconi. He was in the audience um, yesterday and now at the University of Padua. Uh, he played a big part in uh, helping Jonathan with all this um, electrochemistry and with the EPR, where uh, you see the uh, <coughs> signal here that uh, shows that uh, we have radical character for the uh, monoradical and, by and large, for most of the others, uh, not very much in terms of radical character. The radicals are really being shared between um, the various different units. And so, effectively, oh, the basis for uh, switching between, at the top end, a paramagnetic system and a diamagnetic one. And uh, if we just summarize everything, then uh, these are the six that uh, we've seen. Um, <coughs> and these, are, I say, have been the uh, main players um, in this particular 
opening up of uh, the um, homocatenate of uh, the blue box, if I can put it that way. All right, so <coughs> now I want to talk about uh, some beautiful work that was done with Ma by Marco. Uh, so he said, all right, we've done all this uh, reduction, oxidation, redox chemistry, if I call it that, uh, with the blue box uh, as a homocatenate. Let's look at it on its own. And so in a very, very um, characteristically uh, thoughtful and planned way, he carried out um, the reduction to give us the uh, uh, <coughs> bus radical dication, and then at a higher uh, voltage, uh, in a negative sense, the uh, neutral um, compound. And <coughs> these, incidentally, um, have been uh, all characterized in the solid state. This one, of course, many, many years ago. Uh, the uh, <coughs> one that you get on chemical reduction with zinc dust um, is uh, this one here. Um, and you can see it doesn't change its shape very much um, from uh, going from here to there, except that we get this uh, lining up of the pyridinium units. And then uh, if uh, we use uh, cobaltocene in a more controlled way, we can also uh, carry out this uh, reduction. And then furthermore, by using uh, a total of four equivalents, we can get through to the neutral box, if you like, which we show here in red, where the um, geometry is uh, somewhat different. It's a little bit uh, more like a, a displaced parallelogram. And uh, the uh, interesting thing in terms of the uh, chemistry is uh, that the red box, uh, no surprise, uh, expresses its loss of aromaticity and uh, has characteristics that are more polyene-like in its structure. And the solid state, uh, if we look at it again, um, <clears throat> is such that uh, if you delve into looking at the um, single and double bonds, then uh, you find out that uh, there is more sort of double bond character where you would expect it to be in this uh, structure. Uh, representing it as a polyene. Uh, the NMR spectrum, again, uh, Marco was nothing but uh, an absolute uh, perfectionist with his experimental work. Uh, here you see it, uh, very easy to interpret, and here is the neutral methyl biologen with which to compare it. Um, <clears throat> and I just single out the uh, signals for uh, the H alpha and H beta in both cases, which uh, of course, uh, constitute um, probably an AA prime, BB prime system. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what can we do with the blue box, with the red box? Sorry, once uh, it's been reduced. Well, uh, he was able to show that uh, we could take uh, these uh, pi electron deficient systems and, um, at least in the crystalline state, form one-to-one -one complexes. And again, there was a change in the geometry. Uh, on the um, complexation, as one might expect. So 1,4-dicyanobenzene forms an inclusion complex with the uh, red box, um, but uh, <coughs> not major geometrical changes upon uh, inclusion. And this series of plots just uh, emphasizes the changing characteristics as you go from the fully oxidized blue box to the neutral one, and much as you might expect, we see a decrease in the, um, <coughs> as it were, uh, complexation of uh, the, um <coughs> let's start again. Uh, this is strong complexation. So we see a decrease going in this direction for um, the complexation of these pi electron rich systems, whereas um, we see an increase in the um, complexation as we go from here to the red box for these pi deficient systems. And so the take home messages here are that the donor acceptor um, system that uh, we've known of old um, leads to bistable catenanes and rataxanes through templation that is based on these donor acceptor and hydrogen bonding interactions. And it opened up the door, as you mentioned, uh, again, I won't talk about it today, to working uh, with molecular electronic devices, molecular switches, and ultimately, of course, molecular machines. 
the polyene type structure that we get for the red box uh, ends up uh, giving us uh, rather weak one-to-one uh, -one complexes with pi electron poor acceptors. And uh, the uh, ultimately mechanically interlocked molecules uh, are free of non-covalent interactions other than very weak van der Waals interactions. And we'll come back to that in a second, but let's just look at the radical here. Um, it still has, uh, of course, the uh, crosstalk between the components uh, and leads to, uh, I'm going to talk about this later on, uh, being able to uh, build artificial molecular machines, specifically artificial molecular pumps, where um, we can make very much use of uh, the oxidation that takes place um, when we um, uh, take this tris radical tricationic complex and the Coulombic repulsion that comes in the wake of that oxidation. And so um, I just mentioned that this has opened up uh, some applications in terms of uh, field effect transistors and p-type organic semiconductors. And just a quick look then at the tetracationic uh, catenane of old. Uh, we've had that crystal structure for more than a quarter of a century. Recently, a crystal structure of uh, this uh, monoradical trication and the um, <coughs> dicationic diradical, um, <coughs> um, I think, didn't uh, yield a crystal structure. We'll see in a minute. Uh, and this one certainly did, the neutral catenane. Um, and the neutral catenane, if uh, we go to the solid state, uh, is interesting because um, now we don't have any crosstalk between these uh, aromatic rings. Um, and basically, uh, all the experiments we did with this in solution show that these are very slippery, sliding uh, two rings with respect to each other. <coughs> so, uh, of course, there were no counter ions, and this was part of the evidence that we had the um, fully neutral 2 catenane. Here we have the tris um, cation monoradical, and of course we're back now with crosstalk, uh, both in terms of donor acceptor and uh, some <coughs> radical interactions that are not negative enough to stop the, uh, as it were, uh, organization between the uh, two ring systems here. <coughs> So to summarize, um, we have the crystal structure of old for this uh, tetracation uh, <coughs> catenane uh, for the tricationic species. Um, as I say, this one uh, avoided uh, being crystallized, and so we didn't get a result on that, and the neutral one that showed the looseness between these uh, two ring systems. And so this was one of the many uh, elegant stories that was <coughs> unfolded. And I'm using today to sort of feature the work by um, Italian chemists. Uh, <coughs> so here is Marco. Uh, he's now at the University of Padua. Uh, <coughs> he came from Roma. And uh, in the time he was uh, with me, I think, uh, he published uh, 28 um, papers, as you can see, mainly in Agavante Camille and in Jax. And uh, <coughs> he is as close to a genius, um, and I think Jean-Pierre Sauvage will back me up here. But I'm going to be very public here. This boy is undergoing hell, just as I did at Sheffield in this University of Padova. He writes to me with emails that break my heart. I'm heartbroken when I read them, and he talks about his senior colleagues, as the bullies. This has got to stop in this country, just the way it had to stop for me in the UK. I can't make the message more forceful. They should be supporting him like there's no tomorrow. <clears throat> OK, after that emotional outburst, thank you. So let that applause and let my words make their way somehow to Padua and let these senior people think again. Okay, so 
Now we go to some other examples. Here's a very neat one that uh, <coughs> allows us to make cathinanes by using copper uh, as a dust in order to um, bring about the uh, formation of the tristratical tricationic complex. And then having done that, and it's all in situ, the uh, copper one can be used to effectively drive a click reaction twice over. And so <coughs> here's an example of a couple of cathinanes that have been synthesized uh, in quite good yield by this rather ingenious method. And this is thanks to this, um, <coughs> again, very brilliant uh, chemist, this time from China, Yu Ping. Um, he is now at uh, MIT uh, as a postdoctoral associate, and he is out on the market looking for an academic position in the US this year. Here is someone who is now in an academic position, uh, an all-American boy, Mark Lipke, who came from Berkeley. And uh, what he did, and you know, I want to emphasize that all of this is kind of post-Nobel, and so these young people have complete freedom just to essentially be creative. And so what <coughs> Mark said was, okay, you made this big box way back uh, 20 years ago, and it was a resting place for a couple of tetrathiophulvolines uh, for um, a ferrocene molecule. But uh, could you do something a little bit different and put in the context of the radicals a smaller uh, box inside it? And so he took um, this constitutional isomer of the blue box, uh, now meta-linked, and showed that he could uh, induce it to sit inside this uh, one when it was also reduced. And so now we have this uh, tetraradical uh, tetracation as a nice one-to-one -one complex in this very unusual box-in-box -box motif. And furthermore, he was able to use this motif that he demonstrated to make uh, a rather uh, exotic type of uh, rotaxane where uh, he uses the tetraradical tetra cation um, as the stickiness to bring them together, but then, as we saw before with the simpler systems, the trisradical trication of Hao Li, uh, as soon as they're oxidized, uh, the uh, ring is going to uh, move away uh, from uh, this central position. And so, uh, here you see the uh, uh, <coughs> classical chemical structures drawn out with the same situation as we saw earlier for the trisradical trication. And then in <coughs> research that's going on at the moment by Melissa uh, Dumarty, Tind, Tind, I-N, uh, slipped off the end there. She came from Lyon, uh, again a brilliant young French chemist this time. Um, her dream, and she's very close to um, pulling it off, is to uh, make a zipper-type molecule where she uses these uh, radicals at this end here to uh, bring the um, components together. But then on oxidation, um, the big ring will want to get away from the small ring, columbic repulsion. But at the same time, she's put in these very nice uh, donor groups that uh, it will want to complex with. And so <coughs> she has uh, gone through our synthesis. I don't have time. I just want to put it up to show that um, you know, we spend 85% of our time doing synthesis. And uh, it's a tribute to the students that uh, I put these uh, up without perhaps talking about them, as it is a tribute to her for these uh, beautiful NMR spectra, which show that uh, when the um, tris radical, sorry, the tetra radical tetracation is here, um, then she can see signals for this part of the molecule. And it allows me to make the point that uh, if your molecules are big enough, then you don't end up with a paramagnetic uh, situation that uh, clouds out the whole of the NMR. Uh, those parts that are well away from the source of the radicals, you can see the spectrum very, very easily. And then, of course, when you oxidize, uh, there are massive chemical shifts, and they show that uh, the blue box is sitting on these two um, <coughs> naphthalenes. And so this is Melissa, and uh, she um, 
is very proud of coming from France's gastronomic capital. Am I allowed to say that with Jean-Pierre? Yeah? So we end up in Lyon in the second week of December. It's my last trip this year. And uh, they're determined, I think, to give you a run for your money in terms of uh, feeding us well. OK, and finally, well, maybe not finally, uh, two to go. Another um, boy from Peking University, quite brilliant, uh, has devised a box where uh, he can put, uh, using radicals, um, it inside um, <coughs> this one here, um, the usual uh, original blue box inside this big box, and then he can also have uh, this paradichlorobenzene and uh, can make these Russian doll type molecules. And not content with one, he can make many of these. Um, what they might be good for, we'll see one day down the road. And this is, uh, I call him King Kang, um, again, in a short period of time, being very, very uh, productive. And then, I think this is finally a synthesis of uh, a charged free catenane. Uh, this is by a Vietnamese postdoc who is on the market this year also for an academic position in the US. And using the radical chemistry can bring these rings together and then get uh, very substantial movements, of course, uh, as a result of Coulombic repulsion when uh, they're oxidized. And so this is the radical chemistry where you see the uh, rings uh, matching up with the bipyridinium units. And then um, when they're oxidized, uh, they slip round to the um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, triazole uh, rings, the five-membered rings, uh, to get away from the charge. And uh, he has repeated this with uh, a necklace-type molecule, or a 5-catenane, and uh, again, uh, beautifully uh, characterized by an MR and by X-ray crystallography. So again, this shows that the rings are uh, now charged. They are making themselves uh, <coughs> distant from the charged uh, by pyridinium units. And uh, as we move this round, uh, you might see that they're nestling around triazole units that have been used uh, are, are produced during the click chemistry in making the compounds. <coughs> right, so just to summarize, this is one of our latest publications that made the front cover of uh, this relatively new um, uh, <coughs> journal, Chem. And uh, the interesting thing here, and I don't know what the um, application is going to be, is that uh, we're making molecules with very high charge densities. So the Barnes, uh, <coughs> as it were, um, homocatenane of the blue box has a charge density of um, around about uh, 6.4 uh, per um, cubic nanometer. It shoots up to uh, 7.3 for um, the free catenane and comes back again uh, in the more loosely knit uh, five catenane. And this is uh, Min, who uh, came from Texas and uh, again is uh, just having a wonderful time expressing his creativity. And all of this, I want to get over the general point that if you give young people space, they do remarkable things. Okay, so the radical school, which was uh, founded by Ali Trabolsi, has given birth to all of these people, including Marco Frasconi. And now I want to <clears throat> speak about uh, the work of Christian Pizzato, who um, <clears throat> came from the University of Padova. OK, so before I do that, and I'm ready to just have a breather, and I'm doing all right on time. OK. Uh, I just want to define some icons. Uh, molecular recognition of a <clears throat> donor acceptor type, uh, templation, uh, just using these old templates that we used to use to make uh, six and five membered rings. Radical templation, we again use the lock and key symbolism of Fisher, uh, but note the purple. Heat, uh, redox control, uh, we will see ratios that you saw yesterday. 
and also the use of bass. And uh, hopefully, I can have a rest for four minutes.
another. So uh, all I would say is uh, I'm delighted that Jean-Pierre Sauvage and I think uh, Carmen uh, endorsed my choice of uh, music, yeah? I regret nothing. I think it fits quite well. All right, where am I? Um, I'll have to go like a bat out of hell now. So here, I want to tell you about Christian Pizzato. Is his molecular pump. Uh, you've seen the movie. Uh, here is the compound that uh, he was um, involved uh, in uh, <coughs> using to begin with. He didn't make this. Uh, we'll come to his in a minute. I think I showed this uh, spectrum yesterday, uh, the coming on of uh, the ring system through a process of uh, reduction in oxidation and then waiting for 120 minutes at uh, 42 degrees centigrade for these one and two rings to be feed on. And so we have a situation where, um, as this movie shows, we're moving now away from equilibrium. We are talking about making machines and we're collecting these rings and not allowing them to go back into solution. And the chemistry is um, the, redu the reduction with zinc dust and the oxidation with nitrosyl hexafluorophosphate. And the exciting thing here is that these barriers are virtually, well, they are identical within experimental error for one ring going on and then the second ring going on to this system. And so <clears throat> this is where uh, Christian comes in. He said, well, let's try and speed the system up. And so he took a methylene group out of here and changed the siting of these methyl groups. And yes, he has speeded it up because uh, this is um, <clears throat> what he sees uh, at room temperature. Okay, it's taking the same time as um, it did previously, but now uh, if we extrapolate up to um, uh, 40 degrees, then this is occurring in minutes. And this is published, I should say, um, in the tetrahedron hedron special issue that um, was recognition of uh, Ben Feringa's tetrahedron prize, which kind of got buried uh, in terms of its significance because of the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but uh, let's not be lost of the fact that uh, he had this... Uh, also, um, recognition back in uh, 2016. Uh, <clears throat> so we now uh, make molecular pumps, as you've seen with the movies, with uh, the pumps at each end of long polymer chains. And again, very much uh, Christian's work, uh, making these, um, as it were, uh, <clears throat> uh, dicationic uh, <clears throat> oligomers with 36 methylene groups. Uh, just look again at the beautiful NMR spectrum. Uh, the work is always done, as it is with any Italian postdoc, um, to perfection. Um, <coughs> and here's the creativity again, the use of um, a potential stat that he designs and builds himself in order to replace the uh, zinc and the um, nitrosyl hexafluorophosphate with uh, doing uh, electrochemistry or, if you like, coulometry, and shows that uh, by reduction followed by oxidation, that he can bring on two rings, as he expected, from one side and the other side. And then he can repeat the process and bring on another two and make a five rotaxane. Quite remarkable. And uh, <coughs> the next thing that I want to show here is that, um, that that's just a summary, um, and so is that. Uh, and in the interest of time, we'll move on uh, to the fact that um, we now have uh, an oligoethylene chain here, uh, quite long. These are the uh, descriptors that give you the feeling for its length. And now, uh, first of all, using um, <coughs> cobaltocene and nitrosyl hexafluorophosphate chemistry, we can bring on two rings, so uh, each time, uh, so we go from a 3 to a 5 to a 7 rotaxane and a 9 and 11 rotaxane. And this is now being um, done, now that uh, Christian has left us in the hands of a Chinese postdoc um, with the coulometry system that uh, Christian designed. And so these are the uh, main players in the pump team, uh, fellow Scott Paul McGonagall, uh, Chu Yang Chen, who is now back in China in an academic position, Christian Pizzato, who's in Switzerland, we'll come to him in a minute, and Yun Yan, who's looking for an academic position uh, in the United States this year. Paul is at the University of Durham, having um, uh, effectively 
played a blinder, to use an English phrase, uh, when he was with me. He came from David Lee's group, so he was well prepared to do this kind of chemistry. Uh, Chu Young, incredibly inventive, uh, and will now be, as I say, in China at this university in the south. And back with Christian Pizzato, who um, came from Padua. Uh, he was a recipient of uh, a prize that's probably more familiar to you than it is to me, but as I understand it, this is the prize that goes to the top PhD student in Italy. And he's now in Switzerland. Should he come back to Italy, for heaven's sake, give him all the space he needs, because like Marco, he's shown that he's one hell of a creative guy, right? Yun Yan, also very creative, and as I say, looking for a position. Uh, I <clears throat> want just to mention that the uh, book, The Nature of the Mechanical Bond, um, was published um, in between hearing about Stockholm and going to Stockholm in November of 2016. It's a six-chapter book. I just want to single out the fact that um, it was largely written by a graduate student, again, um, from the <coughs> Midwest, uh, Carson Bruns, and uh, he um, showed that um, the mechanical bond is revolutionizing stereochemistry. And all I will say here is I'm putting up 36 uh, terms that we either had to put into the book or, in some cases, invent. And uh, if people are looking for uh, sort of new fields of chemistry, then I say the mechanical bond is uh, going to open up. And they're not talking about stereogenic centers, uh, chiral centers, whatever you want to call them, but rather in parallel type um, nomenclature, planes and axis of chirality and even helical chirality. So to underline what's going on in my group now, as I say, I'm hardly ever there. Uh, fellow Scott Douglas Philp has uh, come to um, <coughs> promote systems chemistry at Northwestern. He's on the lookout for postdocs and graduate students. He's another very, very bright guy. Um, we have a contact uh, with Tianjin University um, in China, thanks to uh, a close relationship with Jay Siegel. And these are two of my ex-Northwestern graduate students, again, with complete independence to get on and do their own wonderful chemistry in Tianjin. And what um, the, um, <coughs> one of them, the Chinese boy, um, Andrew Su, is doing is to translate the book uh, with the aid of uh, some of his students into Chinese. Just looking at uh, what the mechanical bond has um, achieved, um, now remember that it was 1983 when we had this massive transformation at the hands of Jean-Pierre Sauvage. Um, and you'll notice that catenanes kind of dominated, and of course we know that um, his trefoil knot came onto the scene. It's not included here, forgive me, uh, uh, <coughs> Jean-Pierre, but um, what, what we do see is that eventually the rataxanes uh, take over in terms of the popularity. And you can work out maybe why that is so. Of course, citations follow, and they can be top-notch or they can be less so. Um, where is it happening? The US, the UK, here in Europe as a whole, uh, in Japan and China, probably catching up very quickly. Um, and then finally, we have a foot in the door at uh, the University of New South Wales um, in Sydney, where uh, I'm opening a laboratory with the help of these two, Icelandisher, Icelander uh, Pali Thordeson and uh, the chair of the department. Um, Scott Cable, um, and you'll see again, even though I'm not uh, in any way have a car in uh, the Southern Hemisphere yet, they have got the parking spot ready for me. Um, I don't know what we do about bicycles though, Ben. Uh, that will come later if you come to visit. Uh, <coughs> there you are. Uh, well, I can't say too much about uh, Sydney other than it's a fairly spectacular city. Uh, and here is the building that is being produced uh, for our lab there in the new year. And already, Don, uh, DJ as we call him, Kim, uh, is there. Uh, he's studying batteries uh, coming from Korea. And this is, again, Albert Farenbach that you heard earlier. He's now pursuing the origin of life. OK, so I've got some philosophy to end with, if I may, because uh, people do ask me um, 
and I give in eventually, how are you successful in academia? I put teaching students before research to let students take ownership of their research, uh, getting my point across, I hope, to put your students before yourself, right? Give your students space and the world will change to support your students through thick and thin. You don't bully them, you support them. It doesn't matter what you do, support, support, support them. To identify a line of research that is receiving little attention, to recognize that progress in research will be slow, to be able to appreciate the significance of a discovery, to find out how to manage research, that becomes more important as your um, influence grows to employ best practices in writing grants and scientific papers, to set very high standards in presentations, oral and written. And it helps to be healthy, have the strength of a horse, and to be able to take much criticism, because that happens if you do something new. Human beings don't like change, and you need to work hard at things. Um, <clears throat> in a general sense, treat people how you would expect to be treated yourself, be respectful towards people younger than yourself. Now, I went through hell and back when I was an assistant professor at Sheffield, so that is why I feel so strongly about these points. Treat people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds exactly the same. Think before you open your mouth. Realize we live in a village. Don't speak ill of other people. Be more ready to give than to receive. Be supportive to those around you and be ready, willing, and able to hand out praise. Work out how to turn bad things into good things because the secret of success is the capacity to survive failure. And according to Warren Buffett, this is how you can be cool. Always say thank you. Apologize when you're wrong. Show up on time. Being nice to strangers. Listen without interrupting. Admitting you were wrong following your dreams, being a mentor, learning and remember people's names, and hold, <laughs> holding doors open. Right, finally, uh, I've got to get this on my chest. Research should be about people, not about projects. So back to, not the bush you know, but one of an earlier time, uh, the scientific advisor to Franklin D. Roosevelt back in 1945. Scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects working on subjects of their own choice in the manner dictated by their curiosity and exploration of the unknown. Retirement, retiring president of the Humboldt Foundation, Helmut Schwartz, fundamental research gives young people the opportunity to head for new shores. In order to master the future together, the enthusiasm of young, young, young people is the most secure currency we have. The principle of trusting people, 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 rather than trusting a monitoring system based on the distrust um, has proved its worth. The principle of funding people rather than projects has withstood the test of time. And it's not just in the scientific world. Here is an author, a New Zealander, Eleanor Caton, who won the Man Booker Prize, talking about a university. The purpose of a university is not to replicate, but to enlarge. Not to simplify, but to understand. Not to reflect or serve the world in which we live, but to enrich it through the creation and exploration of an infinity of possible other worlds. Right, so I'm a great advocate of tackling a big problem, but other people have been as well. Here is what Venka Ramakrishnan, Nobel laureate in 2009 at the Cambridge Lab for Molecular Biology has to say, I found that almost nobody there was working on routine problems just because they would lead to publishable results. Rather, they were trying to ask the most interesting questions in their field and then developing ways to address them. The other lesson was that even very famous scientists would ask questions at seminars that were often trivial to people in the field. It reinforced in me the feeling that ignorance is not something to be ashamed of and that no question is too stupid to ask if you want to know the answer. And so finally, this uh, classroom article that uh, I was invited to write for Nature Nanotechnology, um, I extol the virtues of doing your own thing. So um, a bit of advice to the young people who want to 
take a risk to achieve something that is impactful in contemporary science and to be singled out as a scientist who leaves their mark on science and ultimately technologies, you need to become recognized widely as having done your own thing. This goal means that you make a conscious decision. It has to be a conscious decision to summon up enough courage, and you heard my other co-laureates emphasize this point as well, to, take a big pro to tackle sorry, a big problem for which no one has provided a satisfactory scientific answer. Tackle a big problem. Finally, I have to give way with great pleasure to the father of molecular machinery. We had the great good fortune to collaborate over a period from, I think, 1988 to 2006 or 7 with Vincenzo and with Roberto and other members of the team here. It was a huge pleasure. It brought me to um, this wonderful city many times um, and uh, have many happy memories. And um, as I said yesterday, um, I've changed the title, a scientific giant. What a gentleman, outstanding scholar, creative person, terrific teacher, a prolific writer of books in particular, but also primary publications. And as I found out, time and time again, a passionate scientist and a very caring person. Knowledgeable, thorough, meticulous, organized, concerned, witty, and pocky. Thank you. So this was a beautiful journey across beautiful molecules with Hollywood level special effects. So your days in Los Angeles have been fruitful in this regard. So thank you very much, Fraser. Also for the extra scientific reflections, which I, I really appreciated a lot. So we are running a little bit late, but not for your fault, Fraser. Eh? So we can have maybe a, one very short and very urgent question, if there is. Well, maybe if not, uh, we...